Hi, guys. Paul, Felicia, how are you guys today? Very well, thanks, man. Thank you. How are you doing, Felicia? I, I know you. T- I, I, we really appreciate you doing this today. I know you're not necessarily feeling at 100%. You mentioned so this is great. Uh, the audience appreciate that even more uh, because they they appreciate the dedication. You want to tell people about what you guys are doing, and um, yeah, it's always greatly appreciated. I appreciate it. Everyone else does, I'm sure. So I wanted to kick things, start things off by introducing you guys. You know, the co-founders of Tillet. We'll talk about Tillet. But first of all, Felicia, ladies first. Do you want to give us a bit of an intro into as to who Felicia is before we start talking about Tillet? Sure. Um, so, yeah, so I'm uh, the founder and CEO together with uh, Paul of Tillet. And I used to be a fund manager before uh, setting up Tillet. So I come from the kind of dark side of financial services, uh, of uh, being an investment analyst and then a fund manager uh, before. And I just spent about eight years uh, doing that. And, uh, and yeah, and then uh, well, I'm sure we'll come on to why we started Tillit, but it was, uh, despite very much enjoying my job, um, there was from a personal side, that there was a lack of a good platform that really helps people make great investment decisions. So that's why I left and then uh, did a bit of a, I did a short stint of learning how to code actually for three months for General Assembly. That was great fun. Which uh, is incredible because uh, not everybody in the, in the startup world who decide to open up a, a you know a tech startup uh, f- finds the founders of a tech startup or co-found a tech startup actually do that. So we'll we'll talk about that. That's imp- very <laughs> that's very impressive. That don't sell that short. That was, it was uh, really good final, fun. Uh, Felicia's final project is essentially part of our onboarding process because it's it's a game that everyone is not compelled to play but strongly encouraged. In front of everyone else. <laughs> that is incredible. In, in my defense, Paul, that was actually the first project that I built. My final project <laughs> was actually an MMMM VP of Tillet. So, but yes, that is indeed a very um, strongly encouraged game that we, um, Space Penguins, that we encourage people to play. But yes, oh, that, sounds, that sounds cool. I want to play that. <laughs> I definitely want to play that. We'll, 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 we'll send we'll, you the link. <laughs> yes, please. We'll definitely talk about that. So, okay. You, you, so, to go back to you then, you've, you've done that. You've done the. Um, the the um the course you've learned how to code is it because why why did you want to do that why did i want to learn how to code yeah uh i mean i've always been curious and i love a good challenge and and i kind of wanted to see if i could do it i think as well um and and also most of the people i know were rather i didn't know anyone who worked in tech and if you're going to get into fintech i thought it would be possibly helpful to at least understand even a little bit more about the community, getting involved in the community, but also even understanding very simple things um, uh, in terms of just language and so on. Even though I can't do what our brilliant developers do, never mind what Paul does, it still helps me understand a little bit of, of how they're approaching things uh, in some aspects. So, so yeah, so it's curiosity, wanted to challenge, wanted to do something else. Um, and, and yeah, so it was never the plan to actually build the platform myself. It was just more to kind of get into the community a little bit. Uh, that's why. But I really, really, I ended up becoming a little bit obsessed with it. I really loved it. And I've it's, always it's loved languages. Bug. So Yeah, it, is, it definitely is. And so for me, I see it as a marriage of languages, which is something I've always really enjoyed doing, and creativity. And it's kind of the sky's the limit. And so, yeah, I really enjoyed it. There is that feeling to coding, absolutely. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and pretend to be an expert coder. I mean, I'm so bad at it. I don't longer do it for a living. <laughs> but there is the thing that you do feel that, you, yes, you can do almost anything. If you know how to code, you feel like, oh, I can just do stuff. Um, and it's something we really encourage all, all co-founders and founders to just at least learn. We're not saying you are going to code your own platform, but please learn it. It, it gives you so much. You... you, you as exactly as you said, you get to understand things completely differently, and it really, yeah. really helps. So, wow, well done! We, we, we could definitely use you as a role model for many <laughs> uh, future co-founders. Um, Paul, moving on to you, we've been talking quite a bit about Fel- uh, Felicia. Now it's your it's your turn. So you are also a co-founder uh, and the CTO of Tillet. Who is Paul? Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm a, a software developer by trade. My whole background, my whole professional career has been software development. So I've been an engineer for six, coming up on 16 years, I think. Uh, and wow. it's been a real mix of stuff. So some startups, some big firms, both Felicia and I used to work at Bailey Gifford. Um, they've never met while we were there. Um, but I've worked at little startups, worked in biotech and finance in a few different places. So it's been a quite a varied journey so far. Um, 
Uh, and then I I left my last place when Felicity approached me about Tillis and the idea and kind of coming on board to help build it. I um, was quite happy where I was. And then she made a very strong pitch for it. Like, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm going to kind of come and help do that. So, <laughs> and, and so, so basically the, you uh, left to, the to, co- to help Felicity, uh, Felicity basically co-found Tillit. Yeah, so I, I was working at Bailey Gifford for uh, seven years in total. I left the just for a change, and then I was working at a, another scale-up, I guess you'd call it, called Calusa, that was doing um, smart metering work and uh, smart grid stuff. And it was then that I uh, met Felicia, and, and it became clear. It's like, yeah, this, this is a pretty cool idea. Let's go build a platform. Okay, well, it does sound quite cool. I mean two people leaving their jobs to say look let's do it usually that's how that's that's how um successful startups begin because you have to found what well, there's many co-founders as, as they usually take but uh they believe in the idea they leave their jobs and they start it and how long has it been since you guys have come together and co-founded till it yeah that's a good question so we started we were introduced so Till it was formally set up in in terms of a company's house, like all the regulatory stuff uh, or the formal stuff um, at the end of 2019 in December. But it was starting to be built in 2020. So, you know, small thing like COVID came along and we were all locked up. (laughs) And that was quite an interesting time to kind of move forward. At that point, when COVID hit, Paul and I hadn't uh, met yet. Um, But we were introduced in the beginning of kind of, well, around April, um, and we were introduced by a mutual connection and uh, started having kind of, uh, well, uh, weekly Zoom meetings, really, to get to know one another, um, talking about what it is that I had in mind for Tillit, whether that resonated with what Paul believed in. Um, and, yeah, and we did that for a few weeks. So that was, yeah, about two years ago um, now and uh, almost. And we worked together for all almost a full year if not more actually before we even met in person so the whole team so we raised the first round in October in 2020 uh, and then started building the team but it, because of lockdowns and because of various aspects and Paul lives in Edinburgh I live in London um, we only actually met in person in June the following year and so we're really quite surprised at how well we managed to work together the whole team to be honest without meeting in person even to begin with um, so that was that was great. Even though we do really enjoy meeting each other in person as well, and we do do that regularly now. But uh, yeah, that was quite an interesting way to start the journey. Okay, we've here's been a bit super of a, lucky. Uh, sorry, I was going to say we've been super lucky on uh, the way that the teams come together and how well everyone works together. Because obviously, if you don't, the the entire company essentially has been formed remotely, and everyone who's come in, uh, the whole interview process has been essentially remote that wasn't an in-person component to it and yet we've got this crew of six folks who all happen to gel really well and, and are pulling in the same direction so it's been i, I think we've been so, pretty lucky on that one well i mean lucky and clearly you've 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 you've, you've worked hard enough to to make it happen it, it's not it's not easy uh large organizations struggle um with with um remote onboarding and uh, I know quite a few who, who who have really struggled to onboard their their um basically the staff new staff that they've they've, they've hired uh, various seniorities um so it's no small feat but here's a bit of a curveball question is the re- the remote flexibility going to give you, carry on for to let employees going forward is that going to be that's it's a philosophy you're happy with it or is that going to change um Quite a few organizations have decided to change now to go back as many ta- uh, as much into the office as possible. So, see, I think for us, it's almost COVID coming along. Obviously, is a was a hugely challenging time for a lot of uh, a lot of people in a lot of different aspects. But for us, it almost enabled us to do. Before I even met Paul, I was very sure that I wanted Tillit to be a an inclusive and flexible company in the sense that. One of the things that I perhaps struggled with sometimes in my uh, previous career was that you only had to kind of, you had to work from one location. And and I think in today's world, personally, I don't think that you should necessarily have to choose where you live your personal life just because of where, where you work. And so I didn't know that before, you know, Paul and I was going to come together that Paul would be based in Edinburgh. I have, whilst I've lived in Edinburgh, I have no intention of moving back to Edinburgh. Paul has no intentions to move into London. So it meant from even, you know, that was one of our very early conversations, to just be clear, are we both happy with this, that we're always going to be in two, two different locations? And, and it means that from day dot, 
it's been part of how we think about the company. So there will always be an element of not the whole team will be in, in the same location. So we have to make it work for everyone else as well to if they live somewhere else. So, so far, everyone in the team either works or lives in or around London or Edinburgh. Uh, but this year, for the roles that we've started hiring for this year, it's the first time that we are considering fully remote, but still UK-based individuals as well. And so I think it just speaks to, as Paul said, the, the general way of how we try to do things, not just how we onboard uh, people, but how we try and build the culture uh, even virtually with one another. So even though we can still meet in person with candidates, the whole interview process is still fully remote. Um, and I think we we try to find ways for the whole team to come together from time to time. but they will always be a big part of how we do things will, will be done virtually. Fantastic. That's, that's, I mean, that, that's, that's great. And I like that you're, you, you know, you're, um, you, you've kind of set in stone the culture of how you want to, to look like, and you've basically started implementing it from, from the get go. Um, and, um, you know, in, from experience within our community companies who tend to really, uh, pay a lot of attention to their internal culture company culture it really reflects on their uh, product branding and their consumers at the same time it, they're just completely very interlinked these days they're not separate entities um especially when you're you know if your consumers let's just say are people not just large organizations then it has a massive massive effect um okay let's 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 talk about till it this is you know we, we we've been talking around it around how, how the people behind it how, how, did, how it came about what is to let felicia please what is to let yeah sure i'll i'll start and i'm sure paul will um fill in and add to that as well but i think in in simple terms uh till it is an investment platform for individuals like you and i and um to invest our long-term savings uh into funds and we've built a curated platform so instead of being overwhelmed with thousands of funds Every single fund, investment trust, three TF until it is handpicked based on a lot of experience and expertise and our own kind of dedicated fund selection manifesto that is on the website as well. Um, and what we try to do is we try to help people empower them with information and understanding and being able to make informed investment decisions with ease through the platform. Anything to add to that, Paul? That's a pretty good summary. The, uh, I wonder if the differentiator for me when we started talking about it was the focus on context building and storytelling around the fund. So it's not just as a chart, has some dry numbers. Um, the, there's more information there to give you a flavor of who's behind it. What are they? How do they see the world? What are they trying to do with the fund? So it's it's about presenting information to let people make those investment decisions based on you know as as holistic a view as as we can uh, as we can get and it's something that we would struggle to do if we had a much wider base of funds as well because you can't go as deep on them so we can focus in on these guys and we can we can really uh tell a, a strong story about each one and why they're there and what they're about and let people make the decision afterwards on is that right for me which is why you said on the website they are handpicked then this is why you say they're handpicked because you're mm -hmm. selecting them okay um now i i know you've Technically, if you said you've touched upon that at the start, but uh, let's just slightly go back to that. Where did the idea of Tiller come from? Why? What, you know, you, you you started talking to Paul, you guys came together, but why? That's the big question. I can, I can keep phrasing it differently, but it is. <laughs> why? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it boils down to personal frustration. I think a lot of founders, very selfishly, uh, kind of go off to, to build something to solve a problem that they yeah get really frustrated with um and for me it, it came out of the idea uh even before meeting paul came out of uh, a personal frustration which i alluded to a little bit in in my old job whilst um i was an investment analyst and then later on a fund manager managing money for other people i looked at how do i invest my own savings and i always struggled on the platforms that were available to make what i thought were informed investment decisions so, so there's both, I found an overwhelming amount of options out there, but then also to figure out whether I should invest in fund 355 that is global or, you know, fund 338 that is also global. There wasn't enough information in my personal opinion to be able to make an informed decision. Uh, it was, Paul talked about that, you know, there was a performance chart, there's a name, there's a bio and 
this person went to Oxford 20 years ago and then there's 10 stocks that may have been in the portfolio. For me, I felt that I can't make good long-term decisions based on just that information. And I think, so I, I complained a lot about it to everyone who would listen and people who wouldn't probably want to listen. Uh, and eventually it was actually my best friend who just said, probably to ask stop talking, to be honest about it, uh, to why don't you just stop talking about it and do something about it. And, and I think at that point I'd been with Bailey Gifford for five years and it was the first time that I started thinking about it from the perspective of, do I know enough about the industry and funds and what makes perhaps a good fund to be able to try to build something that's better, something that actually helps people make more informed decisions. Um, and at the same time, most of my clients when I was a fund manager were institutional clients. So pension funds, um, sovereign wealth funds, all of those different structures and the process that they go through to select the fund manager is completely different to what we have available as individuals. And, and that is much more going deeper into the qualitative things, such as what is the process of the, of the fund managers? What is the philosophy of the fund? What are they trying to achieve over the long term with this fund? What is the culture in the asset manager where they work? And, and you get a much more holistic view, as Paul talked about storytelling, um, to give you an understanding for how something might perform in the future rather than just looking at the past. And so that's what we're trying to do with Tillit, of building a platform that genuinely helps people understand what these funds are actually doing and then help them figure out, is this right for me or not? Without giving them personal advice, we're giving them the, the tools and the understanding to be able to put together their own portfolios. So that's where it came from. And then Paul was very, I'm very delighted to say, you know, equally excited about the prospect of building something that actually helps people make better investment decisions. I think, so, maybe, without putting too many words in Paul's mouth there, actually. No, no, it's exactly the same because I, I like my whole professional career. I've been investing like a little bit into a stocks and shares I saw or into a, into a SIP and it, exactly the same frustrations manifested for those 16 years. So it was, it, it didn't take a lot of convincing when we had that first chat. Like, yeah, all right. On board. So it's not, really, think, a, it's not so, really a case then. It's not a case of it's a big growing market. We could do things slightly differently. It's actually more of a case that there is an actual gap. There's something missing in the market. And till it is either the answer or an answer, basically. To yes, I think, I think, I mean, it's, it's a huge market. There's huge potential here, of course, but that's not where it's not, here's a big market that's growing and there's big potential. That's why let's find something and, and, and plug it into the market. It's much more born out of that, of, you know, coming back to, if I, as an insider in the industry, and ironically, one of the, the funds that I was managing was listed on the platform I was using. So if I still, with all of that knowledge and that insider information in terms of how the industry works, cannot make informed decisions, personally, I was kind of wondering, well, what chance does anybody else stand? And, and in that sense, I think what we're trying to say here as well is that we believe that there is a, a need for this, even for experienced investors. So people have been investing for a while, still struggle to make decisions, make them in an informed way and actually understand what their investments are doing. And so that's what we're trying to solve here because eventually that will benefit everyone, whether you're a novice investor, you're an experienced investor. And so we're trying to come at it from that, uh, that element of enabling people to be in control of their long-term investments and being in control with confidence and making decisions with conviction. Um, if that makes sense, rather than just here's another Me Too product. So does that mean you're, in a way, um, giving people who haven't really considered investing, you're giving them an easy way into that? So people who aren't really in this field, they've never probably looked at investment, they've probably heard about it, but not really went and done anything about it, is to let there's no wrong or right answer here, but is it a way, is it some, is it, does it make it easier for them? to understand investment to sort of say okay this this is clear for me this in a way it's a lot clearer it's not as intimidating as i thought it would be i think there's um, two parts to that answer the first one is that at this stage we are prim principally targeting people who have been investing for a little bit whether that is three years whether that's 10 years whether that's 15 years but it's people who've already understood the benefits of or the potential benefits of considering investing in the markets for one way or another, in one way or another. And so there isn't that initial educational element of should you invest or shouldn't you invest. There's people who are already on board with, I want to invest, and they're doing that on other platforms, but they want to make decisions in, a, in that more informed way, understanding more about it, being more in control, 
knowing where their money is invested and all of those different aspects. However, that's the first part because we start as any startup, we have to be focused, we have to start somewhere. And it comes back to that point of if I, with all of, you know, I understand all the jargon, that doesn't mean that I still can make great decisions. So we're starting with that group of customers because we think that they are um, kind of closest to understanding the problem and already involved and, and want to find a solution. And I think as we grow as well, because even from the beginning, what we try to do is use as much plain English on the platform as possible. So at the moment, it's it's not, it's open, so anyone can sign up. So we don't control, are you a novice investor? Are you an experienced investor? You can sign up and you can have a look around. And we try to build the platform in a way that the information that is on there is as free from jargon as we can make it. And we can, we definitely have a lot more that we want to do here as well, but we have jargon flashcards, we have inside articles, we have glossaries, we have little short paragraphs on the platform itself of if you're clicking on value investing, what does value investing mean? So it's trying to be educational without being patronizing uh, already from the get-go. So it does mean that we do see, and, and I personally always love to see when we get feedback from people who self-identify as a novice investor and they say, wow, I really now understand what this does. And that that's so great to hear because I think it means that we're doing something right of being able to help understanding and increase understanding and, and therefore increase engagement as well. And people want to engage with the money. It doesn't feel as alienating and I don't know how to do this. Um, and I think everyone, regardless for how, um, regardless of how long you've been investing, everybody prefers to read things in plain English. No one enjoys reading jargon. So why why do we bother with that? Um, yeah, sorry, that's a bit of a long rant, but... No, no, me. no, it's very clear. No, thank you for that. Thank you. So, but but this, this, this does kind of, it brings a question. And, um, and I suppose, you know, I'll, I'll ask this to Paul. Does does it, does that mean Tillit the distinctive element of Tillit compared to other investment platforms out there? Is it the content and experience of the team who, you know, manually handpick the funds to invest in, or is there anything, you know, or is it the tech behind it? What is it that's making Tillit distinct here in this case? Could be, could be a combination of the two, of course. I think, well, the way we think of technology in general is it's an enabling function. It's not the point of us. So if it happens that using some technology lets us do what we want to do with Tillit, which is around letting people make good long-term investment decisions that they understand they're confident with, then we'll we'll look at the technology. And we do that, I mean, we'll, we'll go into that uh, a little later, I guess. But for me, the the two aspects that I think set us apart, probably one is that process around the transparency of fund selection and all the due diligence that goes into that and how we're picking the funds. Um, and the other is just starting from the customer and working backwards. So when thinking about an experience on the platform, however, in whatever aspect of it, onboarding, trying to just compare funds or look for information about a fund, we start from what that customer is going to feel and, and see and what they're trying to achieve and work towards how we're going to implement it rather than starting from uh, a technology basis or kind of you know a, a system architecture basis. So we're, we're very design driven. And because we start from that point, we also manage to get the views of the entire team in early to everything that we do. Uh, so it's, it's not like there's a product team going off and figuring out, oh, it's got to do this, and then a handover to a tech team. It's everyone in a room together. It's a shared doc. It's everyone coming up with ideas. It's sketches on whiteboards. It, it, there's a real melting pot of ideas. And I think everyone in the team probably has something of themselves delivered to prod, like some idea that was purely theirs that is now out on the platform, which is the way we'd like to continue. But so essentially, it's exactly to, to, to you know, not to use your own words, basically, but as you said, in this case, in the Tillit's case, technology is an enabler. So it's actually the real power of Tillit really is the team behind it rather than um, a, 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 an algorithm or a, uh, you know, uh, a code that you've written, which is, you know, I suppose, patent and groundbreaking. It's the team behind it that's using technology to give something different to, to basically to the customers. I think that's probably a fair characterization. Certainly the, the tech is lower down my list of things that I think set us apart than than everything else we're up to. But, that, but, that, but that's, a, that's, a, that's a huge distinction. I mean, in, in my opinion, um, my humble opinion, I would say, um, I'm, I'm a huge fan of uh, startups like that. And actually here in Silicon Roundabout, we are, we are huge. I mean, we're huge fans. We appreciate when there's some sort of a secret source, if you like, 
um, that companies have, but it's when when technology is used merely as a tool and the real power is the people, the people themselves, what they bring to the table, that's, I suppose, what makes the startup or the product. Um, we, we certainly look at that. Um, uh, we value that very, very highly. Um, but let's, we, we have to dig in. This is Silicon Roundabout. This is tech. We can't not talk about the tech behind it. But we cannot just brush it aside. What is the tech? I can I can already feel the listeners, the audience in my, you know, <laughs> be, behind me kind of saying, okay, Mustafa, get down to it. What's the tech? What is going on? Explain to me the product, please. As much as you can, obviously. Uh, sure. So I guess as a, as a mental model, thinking about it in terms of an online store probably isn't a bad analogy in that we have a, a product catalog. So we've got the set of funds that we offer. And then we've got you know, there's there's a payments side to it. There's an identity sign up side to it. There's a fulfillment side to it. There's some reporting. But if you have in your head kind of retail, uh, you know, like a, a clothes shop or something similar, actually the moving parts are quite similar. It's just how we do fulfillment is talking to a custody provider who happens to provide an API. So we we kind of, as I said, we start with the design. Um, the front end is quite uh, a modern tech stack, so it's React, TypeScript, and GraphQL all coming together to to build the user experience that we've designed out. Um, we're starting in on things like D3 and WebGL to start looking at actually the ways that we can visualize aspects of of funds performance, your accounts performance, connections between funds. What are the ways that we can make that really interactive and make that sing, uh, so that when you hit the platform, it's not just transmit only. There's something a bit more engaging there. Um, and then the back end of it, a lot of the heavy lifting is done by our custody partner. Um, so Seco Custody, who managed the kind of cash handling and the settlements and order management. And we connect with them through uh, REST APIs, similar with, uh, we've got an IDB for a provider that helps us out with IDB. Um, Trilla, obviously we, we use for um, open banking support. And then in between that is our um, model of the world and our product catalog and how we represent customers and clients and how we think about reporting that we're going to give or how we're going to give them the ability to search or filter the universe that we've got. And because we've got so many different streams of data now coming in and more kind of planned to enrich that fund universe, um, that data modeling exercise ends up being probably one of the more interesting uh, back end pieces. And then we try and kind of leverage the work that we've done there and expose that in the front end in a way that's really engaging for the customer. Okay, that's really interesting, actually. That's very, very interesting. Um, one question, I suppose, kind of brings itself. Why why not go and start everything from scratch? Back end, build it your own, like completely. From uh, it's, what, what? It, it, is, it is a great question. And it is an approach that we could have taken. Uh, the There's a couple of, of reasons. One is you have a limited amount of time uh, to spend proving something. And the thing we want to prove here is that what we're building is is great, that people love it, that people engage with it, that they, you know, the idea resonates. And the longer it takes to get something out in front of customers, it just lengthens that feedback cycle. And so it's taking longer to learn, actually, is what we're trying to do good. How do we attempt it? Um, so because we haven't had to build a payment system, um, which itself involves regulatory permissions that would have been more time consuming, challenging to do from the get go. Um, we haven't had to build an order management system in itself. We have our own view of the world that represents orders and then it kind of connects off to other things. Um, it means we can focus on what actually adds value to the customers, which is for us, the experience of selecting, uh, learning about funds and how they view information about their investments and how they get a picture of, is this working out for me long-term? Am I making decent decisions? So I think it, it by not building out everything from scratch, we are leaning into the things that let us add maximum value earliest and get feedback from customers to be able to adapt the product. And then when we know we're there, that's when we can start saying, all right, what cool, maybe operationally or uh, economically, it makes sense to pull certain aspects of what these other providers are doing in-house. Um, but the, that hasn't been the focus so far. The focus is build the great product, get feedback on it and iterate on that product, which is which is helped by not having to worry about a few of those things. And it's the stuff that you couldn't do even a handful of years ago because providers like Sackle Custody um, didn't exist. 
really, or they they did in such an old school way that actually by the time you do the integrations with them, you've done a lot of the work that you would have had to do just to do it yourself anyway. So really, it's only been the past two or three years that this has been an approach that's even viable. It, it sounds no, it sounds very efficient. It's exactly as you said. Again, not to use the wrong words, but you are able to use the time that you haven't put into that uh, because there's really no need. You're putting it into what till it really does focus on the product that you're trying to build, basically. Um, yeah, uh, and it also what, means that those it, those back end pieces that perhaps Sackle is doing or ITV providers doing or, or Truelight is doing, they're doing those things with much larger teams and they dedicate a lot of expertise to how they run as a process, who supports them, how they're um, operated and, and how they're supported and how they're audited. You know, it, there's a lot of moving parts there um, where conceptually you could draw it on a board and go, yeah, we could probably bash that out. But then it would be a case of bashing it out. It's not a you. You would be hard pressed to do it as well in a decent time frame without expanding the team quite dramatically. Um, so it really is a case of like, why are we adding value by doing that? And the 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 calculus of that will change over time. Um, but at this stage, it's you know, it's it's lets us focus on the things that move the needle for customers. Well, then of course, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's definitely done with 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 the. Um... With the best interest, the customer's best interest in mind. You're trying, yeah, exactly. Not, I'm not going to repeat that, but yeah, absolutely, one one hundred percent agree. Um, how many? So, how many people are you guys currently in the company? Well, well, there's six at the minute. Feel so free. It's, it's, I'm counting in my head. No, there's six folks at the minute. Um, obviously, we're in the middle of a a big hiring um, ramp up, uh, having closed seed round. Um, and now want to expand the team to be able to deliver more of that till it experience quicker, better. So uh, three engineers. Are you guys able to share the? Are you guys able to share the fund round? What was raised, or is that is is that yeah. is that um, private uh, sort of confidential? No, it's, it's you could look it up on Companies House if you wished. Uh, it was three point six million um, that closed out around Christmas. Um, that, wow! That congratulations, well done. Spot. Thank you very much. On Christmas so, Eve as well. It's a nice Christmas gift for the company. Ooh, what <laughs> we a com- present! We completed on Christmas Eve, which is, yeah, pretty nice. <laughs> what, a, what a Christmas. Um, have you had a better Christmas than that, then? In that- <laughs> no, no, I don't think so. <laughs> Worked less, though, that was on pretty sweet. Christmases, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> It, 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 you can't have it both ways. No. We, we we can't have it both ways. One way or another, let's be, we, we can't. We, we can't have everything, can we? Um, so you've, you've got six people now. You are growing. I mean, you've just raised a massive, massive round. Um, how many people are you looking to hire? Uh, essentially doubling the team for this year. So I think it's it's seven roles that we're hiring for. And so it's roughly half split engineering and not. Um, and we're, we're making oh. inroads into that at the minute. Yeah. So let's talk about the engineering stuff, because that's really... That's, th- this is what Silicon Roundabout. I mean, I, I, as much as I'd love to say we have, you know everybody in the community but we what we have is tech people so if you you know if we talk about marketing roles here we're probably not gonna we're probably not gonna not gonna, ha- not gonna have many people really who fit the bill so the development wise um as it stands how many people are working on the tech out of the six people uh, there's three of us working on the tech so there's me typically doing more of the back end um and then we've got two one front end engineer mario who's doing design and front end um, and Thomas, who does more of a full stack role, but has been focused primarily on the front end so far. And the intent is to add a body to each of those um, disciplines. So it's one engineering team. We don't split by front and back particularly. Um, okay. And then, uh, so you're looking to hire three more people on the engineering team? Yeah. But it's. I wouldn't want to dismiss just because they're not writing code. I think that's the thing with Tiller is that all of the roles, because we're so small in the way we operate, all of the roles we're hiring for end up influencing the product directly and very viscerally. So content writer has to be able to speak to customers about complex topics and distill that down in a way both that talks to them, but also works from an SEO basis or works from the space that we have on a page um, and thinking about, you know, is this going to render well on mobile or not? So there's still a technical element there, even though that's typically thought of as maybe a, a less technical discipline. Um, equally, fund selection, similar ideas as always research. How are we going to distill it down to make a picture that makes sense to customers and gives them that insight into this is why 
this fund's on the platform. This is what this fund's about. So actually, all of the roles that we're hiring for end up influencing the product. Um, the engineers are kind of the sharp end of writing the code, but far and away, not the only people actually outputting uh, Tillit as a platform. Okay. So, but okay. So that I suppose this comes really with a startup nature. You are a startup. You, it's it's not possible. It's it's not. It's just not possible for startups to have complete specialists in one particular area, um, just because it's not feasible, especially early stage startups. Um, but on the tech side, you said you're looking to bring a body for uh, Mario for Thomas. So what are we talking about here? Because people listening will view this in a way as a job advert. You know, at the end of the day. So are we looking at juniors, mid-level, seniors, what tech stack background? Does it have to do they have to absolutely meet the tech stack, such as you know, the React, TypeScript, GraphQL on the front end side? Yeah, so the, the front end I think is is where we're probably sticking a bit more rigidly to what we'd like to see as a lead front end engineer um help supplement the team, bring a depth of React experience and have a, a pretty strong picture of what best practice looks like and what good looks like in terms of a large scale React app. Because obviously, as we're expanding the product and we're expanding what we want to do with it, the amount of functionality going in there is going to expand very rapidly. And so we have to do that in a sustainable way. Um, so a bit of support on that front by someone who's got the odd war story about you know what's gone well and not in React apps, what can we, what can we avoid um, is where we're looking. And then on the back end, it's a little less specific because it's quite varied on the back end as to what we do. So a lot of .NET Core, a lot of ASP.NET. Um, there's a bit of Node in there as well. But you don't tend to find .NET Core engineers who are familiar with AWS, which is where we live. So everything that we do is, wow. is in AWS. Everything is in the cloud. Um, and everything's infrastructure as code as well. So like deployments down to DNS, the whole thing is is pretty modern in terms of implementation. It's very rare to find anyone who comes in who goes, actually, yeah, I've, I've done ASP.NET Core stuff. And also uh, AWS CDK, and I've got familiarity with networking and with DNS. And you know, there's so many different things that are involved there that actually, for that role, it's really about aptitude and desire to learn. Um, and generally speaking, that's the way we approach hiring until it anyway is, is, is kind of shorthand, but find good people and trust them to do good things. And it's, it's, so it's not that we... case of they come in and meet specifically looking for. It's a case of, okay, you've got some of what we're looking for, or most of what we're looking for, but you're happy to kind of roll your sleeves up, learn, pick things up as quickly as possible, because we need to be, you know, you, as in you understand the difficulty of finding niche people. Well, it's, a, it's a typical startup challenge, really, trying to find people to do the job that a startup needs them to do. Um, but it is refreshing to hear that you are, you know, you're flexible. You know that this is very, very challenging. If this person comes, great, fantastic. Yes, you're definitely welcome. But if you're not there, you're some way there. Um, you are flexible enough to kind of look and have a chat to see whether they would be the right person to jump on, learn, uh, and become, you know, fill in the shoes that you need them to fill. Yeah, I think that it, a lot of it for me comes down to till it as a as a word in Swedish means trust. And at this size of company, but throughout our journey, we'd like to bring people on who we just trust to do great work. And it might be that they don't know how exactly they're going to approach it when they start off with a piece of work, and they we trust them to go off and figure it out. As like, go learn, tell me how much time you need, what resources you need to go and figure out how to do this best. Go do that. And so long as we we know what the scoop is and know right there's a there's a gap you're filling that gap and someone's got the aptitude and desire to learn, that, that sounds like a future tiller to me. Awesome, Felicia. To go back to you just before we kind of decide to wrap off, what would you say the biggest challenging the biggest challenges facing you guys at this point? You've raised, you've got, you know, you you you've you've, you've got the money, you've raised money now, you're hiring. What are some of the biggest challenges you have? I think it's probably for me it comes down to two things. One is finding more great people to to join us in in building this. Uh, we can't, you know, that's why that's a big part of the the money that we raise is going into people because we need great people to build great things. And finding great people, as you mentioned, is really hard, uh, both in terms of developers but also generally across any role. So. Um, hiring is the hardest things generally said to be the hardest things about startups. It definitely is. And I think now in particular, it's really, really hard. So 
we have a very ambitious roadmap. We have a very exciting roadmap, but we can't execute all of that without great people in to, to help us do that in whatever capacity they would come into the team to do that. So that's the more pressing one. As Paul said, we're hiring for you know six to seven roles right now, but that's just right now. Then there's more roles to come later on in the year as well. So there's more hiring to come. So it's an ongoing challenge that is is big and significant and um, will also to a great extent make or break uh, what we do. And then the second one to that, I think, is slightly related, but it is we are early stage still. We've just opened up to the public after being in beta for a few months. And uh, it's a crowded market. Generally, we have to be able to cut through the noise, reach our target customer and and be clear with the value that we add to them. We know that the customers who use us right now um, really like what we what we're offering them and find value in our product. But we need to find ways effectively to reach more of them and to grow the business, uh, both as a company, but also as a customer base and really build till it into into that kind of leading diy platform in the investment space and that will take time and it will take a lot of work and it will take a lot of experimentation and we have to be more creative and uh and more nimble than some of the incumbents that we're up against who have much deeper pockets so we need it comes back to the first one we need lots of brilliant minds to help us figure this out that's probably what i would say huge huge well huge huge challenge definitely but um you know for anybody who enjoys being in the startup world well this is the, the, this is this is such a challenge this is the opportunity this is the excitement um that they definitely look for um felicia paul thank you guys very much it has been absolutely brilliant and a pleasure uh getting you guys to join us here uh on the silicon random podcast i know lots of people enjoy this hopefully you'll have a number of different uh, applicants through 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 this podcast. If not for now, then maybe for later. People, you know, knocking on your door saying, "Hi, we are interested. Is, is there a room for me?" Um, or at least as customers, whichever which, whichever whichever way. Um, but yes, thank you guys very much. Uh, anything you want to add at the very very end? I I, I personally feel there is so much more to talk about, but we are restricted by time. What do you guys think? Paul? Uh, well, I'd, I'd say just, uh, yeah, the, the roles that we're hiring for just now are the kind of the initial ones that we know we want to uh, to get in to keep us moving pretty quickly. But actually, the the longer term, for the right people, we're, we would love just to have a conversation and figure out, is there a way that you can help on, on the Tillit journey? So it doesn't have to be that you come in with, you know, a particular role in mind. It's just, I, I think I've got something to give here. Uh, and this is why I'm interested in it. And we, we just love to have the conversation. And we've had a few of those conversations already. They've been super fruitful. Um, and I'm looking forward to many more. Fantastic. Fantastic. I, I, I know this will be uh, appreciated by the SR community. Um, all right. Once again, guys, it's been a pleasure having you, having you here today. And um, Felicia, and I suppose we will enjoy the sunny London. I'm sorry, I had to just drop it there, Paul. I, I, I just had to. Paul is based in Edinburgh. He was complaining about not having any sun today, but look, we just, we, 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 I can't help it. I'm sorry, I've got lovely sunshine here. I had to drop it there. <laughs> but yeah, th thanks for your understanding, really... man. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're most welcome. Have a great day, guys. And uh, thank you very much for coming on. Amazing. Thanks, Cheers, for, having thanks us, for having us. Thank you very much.